Greetings in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone at EWTN is saddened by the death of Mother Teresa. In her memory, we will preempt our programming later this evening to focus on her life. Now let me welcome you to the premier program of the Coming Home Network. This program came out of a dream of Mother Angelica, her desire to reach out to those outside the church to help them come back to the truth of the Catholic faith, to help those struggling with their faith. Her desire was that this program might help raise the hope and joy of those who are struggling with their faith by hearing the weekly testimonies of men and women, clergy and laity who have come home to the Catholic faith. We chose the name The Journey Home because so many converts share the same feeling that after making that decision to become Catholic, they discover that in fact they have come home. My name is Marcus Grodi. I have had the privilege of being your host on this show. My wife and I went through that journey five years ago. We were both cradled Protestants. I was in ministry for about 15 years, the last nine of which as an ordained Presbyterian minister. But we both surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, and you've got to be careful sometimes when you pray to Jesus, because he'll give you what you ask and seek for. He opened our hearts to see the truth of the Catholic faith. It required that I resign from my Protestant pastorate. It also brought other, on the one hand, difficult issues into our life that in some cases separated us from friends and family, but yet he's brought so many joys into our life through our journey home to the Catholic faith. God also has a great humor because when I left the Protestant ministry, I, I really wondered whether it ever had a chance to have a pulpit again to proclaim the gospel. <laughs> well, here I am never dreaming that I would not only be a part of Catholic television, but that even as I speak, I'm speaking to the potential of 660 million people on television and radio around the world. Praise God. What a great privilege. And so we begin this program called The Journey Home. When we looked at the opening episode of The Journey Home, we wanted to have someone who own journey was very influential in the lives of other converts and Dr. Thomas Howard is such a man he's a great writer he's a professor and the Lord has brought him on quite a journey his book particularly evangelicalism is not enough has had a great impact bringing many back to the church he was brought up in a free church fundamentalist family also spent then 25 years in Anglicanism but the great hound of heaven brought him home to the Catholic Church. He presently serves as the chairman of the Inc. Chair Department of English at St. John Seminary College in Boston. And what a great privilege it is, Tom, to welcome you to tonight's program. Thank you, Marcus. I feel a bit presumptuous to talk to you as, as Tom because you've paid all the dues to have that privileged title of doctor through your writing and your teaching and your speaking. Uh, you are uh, a, a witness to all of us. It has been a privilege to read your books, to know you through the conferences at Steubenville, and you've been on EWTN before, is that right? Yes. Was that yes. to share your testimony? Or? Yes, uh, a couple times with Mother Angelica. It's always fun to be here. <laughs> I know what a family this is. Uh, it's great. They always yeah. welcome you, make you feel so much at home. Absolutely. Um, but maybe we should begin by asking you if you give a quick thumbnail sketch of your journey home. All right. Yes, well, uh, it took 50 years, but I'll, I'll give you the short version. Uh, yes, I, uh, my background uh, lay in what I would consider uh, that wonderful wing of Protestantism. Uh, used to be called fundamentalism. Many fundamentalists prefer to be called evangelicals now. Uh, and that very often confuses Catholics. Basically, it's the same thing. Uh, they are uh, Protestants who love the Lord, love the scripture, love the church in so far as they have some inkling of what the church might mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly it was the example of my father and mother uh, in front of the, the six of us children, uh, which uh, I would say opened up to us the faith and taught us to love the scripture, to love the Lord, to take spiritual things seriously. Uh, and I would, ironically, uh, consider my own pilgrimage to be a straight line. Mm -hmm. Some people would say, my goodness, he's veered way, way off from his fundamentalist roots. But it was fundamentalism that taught me to take the scripture seriously. 
And the more I read the scripture, <laughs> the more I found myself mm -hmm. skidding toward Rome, you might say, mm -hmm. although I didn't know that. Uh, when I was uh, a young man in my 20s, I was received into the Church of England, the Anglican or Episcopal Church, uh, mainly because I, uh, I loved good church music and beautiful church buildings and beautiful vestments and beautiful liturgy, yeah. and you don't get that in the free church. Uh, so I was received into the Church of England, uh, but I had this tremendous uh, undergirding, almost this, this uh, granite undergirding of, of the scripture and of uh, teaching, faithful teaching on the part of my parents uh, that prepared me to move on. Uh, and I was an Episcopalian or an Anglican for 25 years. Uh, and began to read, uh, and I made the mistake of uh, <laughs> reading uh, Cardinal Newman, yes. particularly his book, uh, The Idea of Development of Christian Doctrine. Right. Everybody, yes. uh, if they've heard of one book by Newman, uh, they know his Apologia, the story of his own life. But uh, this was his uh, book, which you can get in a Penguin paperback, about how Christian doctrine developed organically. Uh, the Lord says in the New Testament that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed and grows into a tree mm -hmm. big enough for all the birds of heaven to roost in. And a big tree like that doesn't look like a mustard seed. It grows. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, well, well, but how can something so gigantic as the Catholic Church, that uh, just seems so far away from the simplicity of the upper room and those early household meetings, how can that be the same thing? the same way that an oak tree is the same thing as an acorn. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's exactly analogous to that, I think. But as, a, as an Anglican, I found myself repeating in the, the Anglican liturgy every Sunday, uh, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And that began to get under my skin. Uh, up until then, I had uh, I would have said, well, that's uh, a spiritual reality. The church is nothing but the aggregate number of born-again individuals all over this world who name the name of Jesus Christ, uh, and it has nothing to do with an organization. Uh, there is a sense, of course, in which the Catholic Church uh, would agree with at least part of that, namely, yes, it, uh, there are uh, believers who are not in organic union with the Catholic church, mm -hmm. and yet they are true believers and followers of Jesus Christ. But I found myself uh, more and more uh, unable to answer the question Questions. to myself, why am I holding myself at arm's length from this church of the apostles, the fathers, the martyrs, the confessors, the widows, the doctors, the, and so on? I. Uh, I felt, uh, I felt like the kindergartner with his nose pressed to the window looking in at the party. And uh, I read, I also made the very bad mistake of reading the early fathers. Yes. And the trouble with them, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, Clement of Rome, the trouble with those men is I had to take them seriously because they had been taught by Peter and John mm -hmm. and Paul. This is square one. Mm -hmm and you, you start reading their letters to the churches, and you find out that the, that the hierarchy is there, the episcopacy is there, and the mass is there. And I thought, my word, if uh, one of these gentlemen popped up out of his coffin and, and came to visit my scene, he'd, he'd say, what's this? You know, every evangelical, we used to believe that if we got ourselves back in that first century, that we'd somehow find ourselves yeah. But that isn't what you said you find as you look at the early church fathers. Yeah. What you're finding yeah. is the Catholic Church yes. in the early and, years. Uh, I, and I would also say to the many earnest, uh, zealous Christian believers who say, well, we just go back to the Book of Acts uh, to find our pattern. Well, number one, the, the Book of Acts does not spell out the pattern, uh, for example, for, for their worship. It tells us that they met uh, for the apostles' doctrine and uh, fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers, but it doesn't tell us what they did. Uh, and uh, the earliest documents we have, you, you find the liturgy there. Mm -hmm. Well, to make a long story short, I, 
Uh, I was an Anglican for 25 years, but eventually I found myself unable to give a satisfactory answer to myself as to why I was holding myself uh, X number of inches away from the source. Well, you, this question that you're asking, why, and you talk about a straight line journey from your, the seeds that your parents so faithfully planted, never dreaming where it would lead, but the seeds of faith and with that seed of faith must have been this desire to be faithful to what is true. And it was that straight line arrow that shot you from evangelicalism, Anglicanism. And then what Newman does in the essay is what? It, it kind of brings to life how what we believe today came about over yes. 2,000 years. Yes, I think one of Newman's great contribution and the great help he brings to, to all of us is to show how... Uh, Christian doctrine uh, unfolded and flowered and bore fruit. Uh, again, back to the acorn and the oak, how, mm -hmm. how, how it burgeoned and grew into what it was fully grown. It's all there in the seed. For example, uh, the, the Marian doctrines in the church. I think lots of mm -hmm. uh, non-Roman Catholic believers uh, think that a pope, the popes sit around and think up, let's see what, what quirky Marian doctrine can we think <laughs> up now, uh, and without realizing that every single one of the Marian doctrines is, is deeply and profoundly Christological. Uh, it, it is directly Christological. Uh, and, and I have found uh, in Catholic circles that where people's Marian piety is in good shape, their relationship with the Lord is in good mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. and we took, as non-Catholics, we took the words, let's say, from the Nicene Creed from the Council of Nicaea, but we didn't listen to any very much else that the Council of Nicaea talked about, which talked mm. about Mary, as did mm. Chalcedon. There were statements there very clearly on Mary, yes. way back yes. in the early history of the church. And I think the, uh, again, uh, going back to the Nicene Creed, uh, the, you know, the church is one. Yeah. We evangelicals had a way of satisfying ourselves about that, we would say, well, indeed, indeed, mm -hmm. uh, we are one. And there was a, a reality. You yourself yeah. would, would know that from your own experience one of Jesus. being with yeah. evangelicals yeah. Uh, at a great convention or something. Uh, there was a tremendous and an, and an ebullient and a, a vibrant oneness there. But the, the one that the creed speaks about is, is an organic, visible, mm -hmm. obedient oneness uh, gathered around the chair of Peter in Rome. Or the, the bishop in Rome is the great sacrament of our unity for as long as history lasts. Mm -hmm. And uh, the church was Catholic. We used to tell ourselves, yes, well, that means worldwide. It means universal. But it also, katholikos, the word means the fullness mm. of the faith. It's not the faith with a number of things carved off of it. Uh, the Catholic means of the whole. Yes. And apostolic, I, I, I think I didn't pay much attention to that at all mm. as an evangelical. The formula for me as an evangelical was Jesus, the Bible, and me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a bad formula. Right, that's, and that would have been what we thought united us yes. as evangelicals. Yes. In fact, it's sadly that very much of the faith was a minimalizing to these lowest or yes. common denominators. And then when we got into those areas that where we differed from one denomination to the next, we were forced to think, well, I guess those issues aren't all that important. And yes. the sad thing is ecclesiology goes out the window, sacraments go out the window, orders go out the window, all those things. And maybe in your journey now would be a good place to ask, as you've addressed the one holy Catholic and apostolic church as a, as a theme in your journey, and, and how as an evangelical and an Anglican also you might have viewed that, what do you think during that period about the Catholics claim to be? the one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Well, I had the same view, I suspect, <laughs> that an enormous number of non-Roman Catholic Christians have, namely, how in the world can these Roman Catholics make such an arrogant claim? <laughs> uh, I thought, you know, who do they think they are? We are the one true church. Uh, but if I had listened uh, to what the Catholic Church really says, it, it's a tremendously 
humble and modest mm. and obedient thing. The whole point for a Catholic is this is not our church. We didn't yeah. make this up. We didn't start this thing. And we have no warrant yeah. to, to redraw the map of the universe. In St. Augustine, in his, in his struggle with the Donatists, who were the evangelicals of his day in the, in the fourth century, third and fourth century, he was, uh, he was a Catholic bishop. And his point was, hey, guys, I, uh, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with a tremendous amount that you're saying, but, but none of us has any authority whatever to start this thing over, any more than an Old Testament Jew had the authority to start Israel over just because Israel wasn't doing very well. And I, so in answer to your question, I, I thought it was a, a sublimely <laughs> arrogant claim when, uh, when really it's a, it's, a, it's a very modest claim. It's the yeah. church saying, we don't own this thing. I was impressed th with the way the Holy Father addressed himself recently to yes. the question of priestesses That's in the church. And his phraseology was, the church has no authority mm -hmm. to, to ordain women to the presbyterate. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't, you know, we have decided not to do this, or we have voted, you know, and we'll never let women in, and so on. It's, we have no authority to do this. The, the, the Pope is an obedient, Servant, service, servorum days, mm -hmm. the servant of the servants of God. A servant is that key term. Yeah. Servant. Uh, Jesus said those who would be great must be least. Must be, yes. uh, along with your, this view of what the Catholic Church's audacious claim at that point, uh, were you open at all to the Catholic Church during, during those early years of your stream back to the church? No. <laughs> I, I can remember arguing until I was blotchy in the face when I was in the army with a, with a Protestant chaplain uh, whom I worked for. I was a chaplain's assistant and he was a, he was a card carrying blue stocking Calvinist, but he believed that the Catholic Church was a real church. Yeah. As a fundamentalist, I did not and I can remember practically shouting at him, it, it, it is an apostate church. It, they have added blasphemous doctrines. I mean, I was a real crusader, and which is uh, another note of humor in our current situation. You know and I know, I will, a lot of the audience, uh, the television watching audience uh, knows the name of Scott Hahn. Mm -hmm. he, he was a warrior, <laughs> an anti-Catholic warrior of the, right. of the first magnitude. So I would have to say that uh, early in life, uh, no, I was not open to it. I also though need to pay tribute to my godly parents. They never uh, yeah. ridiculed or mocked or made light of the Catholic Church. They sincerely believed that the Catholic Church was wrong in certain mm -hmm. things, but I never heard them uh, cast uh, facile aspersions on the Catholic Church, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. So what was it? What was it that kind of uh, brought the breach in your, in your yeah. armor that opened the door for you to consider the Catholic Church? Well, I think it was one of these things that crept up on me like, like a tide. You, you, you can't see the tide coming in very well. But during my 25 years as an Anglican, as I say, I did all the wrong reading. And <laughs> it, uh, it began to percolate in me. I began to become aware that the church had been here uh, quite a while before 1517, uh, and I. Isn't it amazing how how we often, as as uh, Protestants, kind of uh, kind of it's almost as if there was only two years between the apostles and Martin Luther. Yeah. Because we didn't know anybody in yeah. those 1500 or, years. Yeah. <laughs> or the Holy Ghost had gone off on a picnic or That's something. Right. <laughs> uh, and and he uh, just wasn't there in the church, but. Uh, Slowly, slowly, uh, I think graciously, the, the Lord just was wooing me and uh, wooing me and transformation was taking place in my soul and I, I was becoming uh, more serious about, uh, for, for example, sacrament mm. and liturgy and the authority of the church. And uh, at the same time, without my realizing it, my strict individualistic Protestantism was was being eroded, or shall I say, being expanded and enriched. Uh, and uh, I think any thinking Anglican uh, will find himself 
asking some very, very, very difficult questions because, of course, the Anglican Church takes the notion of apostolicity seriously and mm -hmm. takes history seriously and sacrament. But where do they get those sacraments? Yeah. Where does that episcopacy come from? Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually, I found myself, to my own great surprise, almost heartbroken at not being a Catholic. I would sit mm. in my study at home reading the Latin Missal, reading the old mm. uh, St. Joseph uh, Latin Mass with tears pouring down my face, mm. feeling, uh, feeling as though I'm missing this, I'm missing this. You know, look at the church to which these prayers belong and I'm not there. Uh, well, how was your family, your wife? responding to all this going on in your life at this time. Well, it, it scared us all to death. Uh, <laughs> my, my children were youngish teenagers then, and uh, they were not as aware uh, of what was going on, but my wife certainly was. And actually, uh, even though she was received into the Catholic Church just two years ago, ten years after I was, I was received in 1985, she was received in 1995, um, but she, she is a great and a wise and a godly and a holy woman. And it was really my wife who was the, the human catalyst. Mm. She, uh, she turned to me one day in 1984 uh, in, in our Episcopal Church during the liturgy. And she said, you're not here anymore, are you? And I thought, oh, God help us all. This, this holy and wise woman has seen something that I am afraid to admit. Yeah. And I had to, set, I had to admit, you're right, I'm not here anymore. I felt as though the ground had shifted under me and that I was looking back at mm. Protestantism uh, from a new position. And then is when I called up a friend and said, do you know if there's such a thing as a priest who will talk to me? Mm. But even there, of course, uh, my wife and I, we had many long, discussions and many tears, it's, it's very frightening, as you know. Uh, I think many Catholics don't realize what a, what a tremendous abyss it is to cross for, for a Protestant, particularly a devout and believing Protestant. Uh, and eventually, uh, I, I think I never would have been able to, to simply throw caution to the winds and give my wife the back of my hand and just say, mm -hmm. look, lady, get out of my hair, I'm going to become a Catholic and the devil take the hindmost. I, uh, she finally said to me one morning, uh, while we were drinking tea or something, uh, you know, she said, I want you to know that not only has the Lord enabled me to sort of grit my teeth and accept your becoming a Catholic or just grin and bear it or neutrally affirm you, she said, he has given me wings of joy about this. That's a work of the and Spirit. It, it really was. And, and, and that was the thing that set me free. Uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful woman. And, and so for 10 years, mm -hmm. we lived uh, in one sense as a divided household, and yet it, it wasn't. We felt that we were experiencing in our own household the something of what Jesus Christ must experience over the fact that his church is mm. split. Yeah. There was no enmity, there was no blip on the screen. If anything, it drew us closer together. Mm. I would go to her Anglican Mass with her. Of course, I wouldn't make my communion anymore. Mm. She loved to come to the Catholic Mass mm. uh, with me. Again, she would not make her communion, but uh, it, it, it flung us closer together. And uh, not to tell her whole story, but she, she began saying the rosary. <laughs> And I'll tell you, if anybody starts that, they're gone. They're in trouble. They're, 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 they're in trouble. In big bad trouble. You know, in in the work which you know about in the Coming Home Network that I that I do in the Coming Home Network International, it's amazing how many converts are confronted with that very issue, where one of them yeah. becomes very convicted coming home, yeah. and then the other one uh, struggles, and there's a tension of timing when, uh, and it, I remember when your conversion happened, is that the news of that hit the Protestant publications and not taken very favorably, I remember. And I'm wondering how your conversion had, what kind of an impact did it have on your life, on your career? Well, on my, on my career, I lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, You were teaching at Gordon College, I remember. Uh, I, I was teaching at an evangelical institution and their, their tradition was such that they simply, uh, it, it just wasn't timely 
uh, it would have been too much of a jolt and a jump for the clientele and everybody. So uh, uh, I resigned. We were all still friends. I was over yeah. at Gordon College last night, as a matter of fact. Literally, they're, they're my dear yeah. comrades in arms. I, and, uh, but I couldn't keep on teaching there. But uh, the Archdiocese of Boston, somehow the Cardinal got wind of this, <laughs> this, this waif, this stray. And uh, I think he passed down the word to some people, find a job for this man. So the St. John's Seminary College uh, helped me uh, and by giving me a job. But uh, I'm one of the lucky ones, actually. Uh, my five brothers and sisters, who all of us are in our 60s and 70s now, but uh, were totally, totally supportive. They're all strong, strong evangelicals, uh, several of them very well-known evangelicals. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, there has not been a blip on the screen, not a shadow of uh, of tension or opposition, uh, even though none of them have followed uh, my exact footsteps yet. Yeah. Isn't it so true, uh, as we, both of us, talk with other converts very often who call us, who are struggling on the other side because they're worried about career, they're worried about the impact on family, on marriage, on friends. But isn't it so true that, that what we both experience is that God is just as faithful? Yes. And I would say, uh, I mean, obviously my wife and, and I, as are you, yeah. are always heavily in touch with and involved with married couples who yeah. face this dilemma. Either the husband wants to become Catholic and the wife is scared to death or is very anti-Catholic or vice versa. I mean, we, we, we both know and are involved in both kinds of situation. And I get asked, what do you do if your spouse wants to uh, move? And I, I would say you, you have to move humbly and slowly. The church is a very ancient church. It's been here for thousands of years. God is not in a hurry. Uh, and if your, you, father, you, mother, becoming a Catholic would be a tearing up of the fabric of your marriage, then just wait. You, and, and sometimes, I, I know, and so do you, people for whom it is a great crucifixion. Mm. Uh, just yesterday, my wife was with a young woman uh, who, who, whose heart is broken because she cannot be a Catholic. Yet, and yet, I've, I've told her on the phone that, that the, you can offer that to the Lord and He will receive that as, as a legitimate, as your legitimate oblation and sacrifice. Uh, she is not free to become a Catholic mm -hmm. because her husband is deeply opposed to it. And it works the other way, too. And I would always say, you're, in one sense, your marriage comes first. You, you must not abandon your spouse uh, and certainly not your children. And our loving Father knows our situations, knows the pressures on our lives, knows the hearts of our spouse better than we do. And so that's why we are to be patiently probably working on marriage even, yes. the issues of prayer and, yes. and, and closeness, which yeah. can go through a great tension in this conversion process, yes. especially for clergy, yes. especially for academics. Yes. And I think a lot of uh, the listeners have, will have read Scott and Kimberly Hahn's book, Rome Sweet Home. And uh, Scott took the step, and it was very, very, very difficult for Kimberly, his wife. And they're, they're wonderfully frank and open and honest uh, and candid about it in this book. Uh, her struggle towards the church, but the Lord's grace in, in helping them. I mean, they, mm. they kept their marriage together. They loved and trusted each other. Uh, but I, 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 I very often find myself saying to either the one spouse or the other, just cool it. Just, yeah. uh, you know, the, the Lord is still there. The church is there. You can, you can make your spiritual communion. Uh, the Lord knows your heart. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, we're going to take a break. I want to remind the audience that you can call and ask Dr. Howard a question. If you call at 1-800-221-9460, or you can email us at journeyhome at EWTN.com. We'll be back in a minute and hear as Dr. Howard shares with us again his journey home.
Welcome back to the premier episode of the, the Journey Home. Our first guest is Dr. Tom Howard, and he's been sharing with us how the Lord has brought him on a very powerful and yet unexpected journey through fundamentalism, through Anglicanism, and then to the Catholic Church. Before we take a, our first call, Tom, uh, I thought it'd be good for you to take a moment to d clearly describe, explain what it is that the Catholic Church means that it is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Yes, well, of course, that's a very <laughs> rich teaching on which many, many volumes have been written, mm -hmm. but I think in a nutshell, uh, it would stem from or flow from the church's understanding of itself as having been born, if you will, from the side of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross, the blood and water mm -hmm. flowing from his side is understood to be as it were, the birth of the church and then the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost, bringing it to life. Uh, and those four marks of the church, uh, the, the oneness is not, not just a theoretical or juridical oneness. It, it very early came to be understood by the bishops all around the Mediterranean. It meant being in visible, organic, obedient union with the, ch the chair of Peter and the successor of Peter in Rome. Uh, the, the bishop in Rome is and came to be seen as the sacrament of the church's real unity on earth, not just a theoretical unity of, a, of an aggregate of people. And, and it is holy because Jesus Christ, uh, the spouse of the church, the creator of the church, the begetter of the church, because he is holy. It's his holiness. It's his body. Uh, yes, it's, it is his body and he is the head. Uh, it is Catholic because it teaches the fullness of the faith, not an attenuated gospel. And it is, of course, universal. And it is apostolic. It is built on the foundation of the apostles. Uh, and the Catholic Church takes very seriously those strange words that we evangelicals had to tiptoe past, <laughs> giving Peter the most hair-raising authority and giving him the keys and saying, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Uh, Matthew 16 was not our favorite text. Uh, <laughs> we worked around it. Yes, and the Catholic Church, I often find myself saying, uh, ironically, people think that the fundamentalists are the ones who believe the Bible literally. Well, the Catholic Church takes the Bible very, very, very seriously. Well, looks like we have a call. Uh, hello, where are you from? Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm from Scarborough, Maine. Welcome to the Journey Home. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Howard, you speak of unity in the Catholic Church, but sometimes it seems so hard to find or even identify today. There are so many groups in this church that, that they can't even seem to get along. Where can one find this unity? In the Roman Catholic Church, the unity is where it always has been and always uh, will be, namely, uh, in the apostolic see in Rome and at the Lord's table. Uh, I often find myself uh, trying to explain to my Protestant brothers and sisters who point out the fact that uh, uh, there are many dissident theologians and you can hear this, that, or the other thing from all sorts of uh, uh, bishops and so on, so where's the unity of the Catholic Church? Uh, no Catholic needs to be in any doubt at all as to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Mm -hmm. All one has to do is to buy a copy of the Catechism and read that, and the unity is there. And any theologian who is teaching something different is not living and teaching in obedience to the Holy See in Rome. You can take your cues from the Holy Father. Uh, and of course, the, the ultimate sacrament of our unity is, is the Lord's table. And again, any, any priest or theologian who is teaching anything different about what the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is at the Eucharist is uh, in big trouble, is a, is a heretic, the early church would have called him. <laughs> Uh, so it seems to me that a, that, a, that a Catholic is in a qualitatively different position when it comes to understanding the unity of the church. 
uh, if, if the church gets down to me and thee and the Pope, it'll, uh, there will still be that unity there if we are living in obedience to the magisterium of the church. Yes, there are dissident voices, but uh, in a way it's a rather bleak encouragement. The problems of the Roman Catholic Church are precisely the problems of the church. Terrible catechesis, ignorance, worldliness, sin, clutter, the whole business. St. Paul had every one of those problems before he got out of square one. <laughs> Read his epistles to the Corinthians. It's a, it, it was a mess. And multiply that by 2,000 years and a billion people and you have mega pastoral problems. But, but any individual Catholic uh, has, has an anchor as sure and steadfast as any anchor in heaven and earth, namely in, in the magisterium of the church. And sometimes when we look at the, the problems that we see in the church and we struggle with this issue of unity, our focus is very small because if we had the privilege to do some traveling around the world and Brit mm -hmm. visit Catholic brothers and sisters in Austria or Africa or Australia, and we see that this church is amazingly united in so many ways. And I've had that privilege, and, and I mentioned this the other night, uh, that it really reminded me of how united we are when I was at a conference in Rome and there were 65 bishops there from all over the world and we were getting ready to sit down for lunch and one of the African bishops from the center of Africa somewhere was asked to say grace and we're all standing for the blessing and what does he say? Bless us, O Lord, and these are thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty. I mean, this is one big church that shares so many traditions which we've learned from one another because we believe that there's one spirit leading this church. Yeah. And the Lord did, pr did say that there would be wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah. He did say the church would be torn. Uh, by dissent and falsehood. And alas, we have that in the Catholic Church, but nobody needs to be in any doubt as to what the Roman Catholic Church is and where it is and what it teaches. And I think a, an individual believer can cling to that. You may be in a parish mm. where that, that's picking up all sorts of things from the contemporary agenda of the world uh, and think, am I the, uh, like Elijah, I even I only am left. No, there are hundreds of millions with you. We have another caller. Hello, where are you from? Uh, William from Connecticut. Uh, I have a problem about this woman who dearly wants to be a Catholic. She's obviously convinced it's true. And there's this heartbreaking possibility that it could break up her marriage. But I'm wondering if Dr. Howard is not rending the cross of Christ void, because didn't Christ predict that loyalty to him would precisely mean splitting up between person. I know this is a heart-rending dilemma, but wouldn't you give more weight to, to the prophecy of Christ about a sign of contradiction? Well, uh, yes, uh, touche. I mean, that's, a, that's a, a difficult question. And he did say, he did say I came to bring uh, n not peace but a sword in one place and to set a man at variance with his father and so on. I don't think that that teaches, uh, I don't think the Lord uh, is using that as a warrant to tear the holy sacrament of marriage apart. It may be, uh, it may be uh, put a tremendous strain on it. It may set the wife at variance with her husband, but it seems to me that the thing they both need to learn then is, is humility, is forbearance, is, is patience uh, in, in this suffering that they, that they have. And uh, I don't know, I, I myself would, would not be able to take it as a, uh, even the scandal of the cross, even the offense of the cross mm -hmm. as, a, as a, 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 a dominical warrant, a warrant given by the Lord to, to rend the, the sacramental fabric of a marriage. Well, you know, due to the great power of high technology, we have an email message awaiting us. So let's, let's hear this. Dr. Howard, <clears throat> you have a new book called On Being Catholic. Does this also talk about your conversion to the Catholic Church? Here's that book, and matter of fact, On Being Catholic. I... Uh, I'd probably have to go back and read the whole thing and see what I said, <laughs> but I, 
uh, basically, the, the narrative part uh, of my story is in the other book, Evangelical is Not Enough, and then a very small one called Lead Kindly Light. Mm -hmm. On being Catholic, really, is a, it's a set of reflections uh, which I wrote after having been a Catholic for 10 or 11 years, uh, so that it is not primarily autobiographical. Okay. It's, if, if anyone's interested in the actual trajectory of my ecclesiology, he'd have to read Evangelical is, is Not Enough. Is it helpful for, let's say, those uh, uh, interested in examining the church and what it means to On be Catholic? On being Catholic? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's very helpful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I, actually, I did try to address myself to the most difficult questions. Mm. And I tried to do it in a non-quarrelsome way. Uh, I, I be, the point being, uh, having been an evangelical for so long, uh, I mean, I know how how Protestants and evangelicals feel. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's not by any means always malice or pettiness or petty-mindedness that makes them level charges against the Catholic Church. So I, have, I tried very hard in that book not to be quarrelsome, but simply to unpack what it is that the Church means by such and such a doctrine. All right. We have another caller. Hello, where are you from? Hi, this is Lainey calling from Birmingham, Alabama. Hello, Lainey. Dr. Howard, I wanted to thank you for your testimony. Um, one of the things that you wrote about in your book, Evangelicalism is Not Enough, that I found helpful was the fact that um, many non-Catholics accuse Catholics who pray the rosary of breaking the command um, that Christ gave us not to use meaningless, repetitive words in prayer. But you pointed out how some of their prayers are repetitive. Can you expound on this? Well, I suppose anybody who is familiar with or lives in the what we call the free church tradition, that is the, the church's uh, of, a, of a Baptist or brethren or free church natured independent chapels and so on, is very aware that the tradition of prayer there is, should we say, extempora prayers or off-the-cuff prayers uh, with the deep-seated feeling that insofar as a prayer is read, uh, it is, uh, or pre-canned, it can't be real uh, precisely because it is pre-canned and isn't, and isn't just flowing out of my heart at the moment and expressing my feelings. Um, there is a point in that, of course, but uh, you know, prayer is more than what Wordsworth would call this spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. We say what we uh, want to say to the Lord or feel that we need to say, but we also need to learn to say what we ought to say hmm. to God. And uh, uh, the rosary, for example, uh, of course, uh, lots of people who say the rosary can easily get into a rut uh, so that it means virtually nothing and they rattle it as fast as they can and so on. But rightly understood, uh, the repetition in the rosary is nothing more than a way of keeping us mortals who live in time um, tarrying. The word tarry I learned from uh, the great Catholic theologian Romano Guardini, his book on the rosary. It is, a, it is a way of tarrying in the presence of one of the gospel mysteries with the one of us mortals, namely the Blessed Virgin, who was the most receptive and the most obedient to whether it was the Annunciation, the Visitation, the, the Nativity, the, finding in the, the uh, finding in the Temple, and so on. Um, uh, so that the rosary, uh, I look on the, the, the actual words of the rosary, uh, this sounds like a, not a very elevated analogy, but a little bit like ball bearings that, 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 that keep one moving along uh, and at the same time uh, smoothly tarrying in the presence of these mysteries. Uh, the other half of the coin that you're asking about, of course, you, uh, I assume, and I, and Marcus, and any other evangelical would be able, would be able to, to make up an evangelical prayer right now, here on the spot, made of nothing but uh, stock phrases. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to praise and thank you for this day, and so on. Uh, and uh, it, it does become as rote as, as anything Catholic, uh, which is, 
uh, not to say that it's not real, but we're mortal, we're human. We, we can't always come up with something new. And I think you probably know as well as I do that very often the efforts to, to make prayer everlastingly new and sparkly and uh, sort of innovative is as dismaying as anything else. Uh, it, it, anything but prayer is happening. Then we're all wondering, where is this going? <laughs> Whereas if, you know, if, 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 I, if I am learning to say, you know, pour forth, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. I, I can't think that up on the spur of the moment. But boy, I mean it mm. when I say it. Thank God for whoever wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got to ask you one last question here because of our time. Uh, I think it's a very important question, and that is, in your journey to the Catholic Church and your journey of coming to the fullness of the appreciation of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, how has that helped you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, coming mm. in, your, in your walk with Jesus Christ? Mm. Well, it's... Uh, it, it's immeasurable. It's, it, it's absolutely immeasurable. I, I, I struggled. I was 50 when I became a Catholic, uh, and I had struggled and struggled and struggled all my life to keep up, quotes, my relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the tools one has in that sector of Christendom are the Bible and one's own, as we called it, daily devotions. You, you, you most earnestly read the scripture and you try to get something from it and you try to make your prayers uh, authentic and meaningful and so on. But stepping into the ancient Catholic Church, I am, I am lifted, I am borne up, I am taken into uh, this, this tremendous current. Uh, every single one of the sacraments is Christocentric. Every single syllable of Catholic devotion, even Marian devotion, is ultimately Christocentric. Uh, I say uh, a good bit of the office these days, for example. And I, I mean, I get out of bed in the morning anticipating being able to say morning prayer. Uh, because it's there. The, the, the Psalms are there. The prayers are there. Uh, the Song of Zechariah is there for me. And then I include the, the, the Te Deum. In, in my prayers. I wouldn't be able to, to, to spontaneously say, we praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord, all the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. Mm -hmm. It has, um, it has uh, immeasurably, shall I say, energized and nurtured and shored up and, and made steady uh, this that you ask yeah. about, one's relationship with the Lord. I, I hardly think of it in those terms anymore. I, I think of myself as a Roman Catholic Christian. That's what I am. Uh, and it isn't, it isn't just little me trying to hang on to the, to the hem of the garment of, uh, of the Lord and do the best I can. Yeah, I, I know it's true for you as it is for me that becoming Catholic has helped us appreciate even more and more John the Baptist statement, you must increase, I must decrease. Yeah. And oh, that we had more time, yeah. you know, to hear all of the details of your journey. And I will encourage the audience to, uh, to look at evangelical, evangelicalism is not enough or lead kindly light to hear the full story. Tom, it has been a great privilege, a personal privilege, because your courageous witness really has meant so much to my wife Marilyn and me at a time when we were struggling. You're a great witness to us and our oh, prayers you are with you and Loveless in your continued you. journey. Thank you. Stay with us now. We'll be back in a moment with some closing thoughts for the journey.
As Dr. Tom Howard has so powerfully challenged us, following Jesus Christ is more than mere believing that he's the Son of God, merely accepting him as Lord and Savior. It means trusting him totally with our life, surrendering to him, and being obedient to his call to be faithful in his church. On the night in which he was betrayed, we read in John 17 that he prayed that his apostles, his disciples, their disciples, their descendants, the church would be one as he is and his father are one. He also challenged all of us who would follow him that we are to be perfect as his heavenly father is perfect. We're called to be holy. Also on that night, that last night before the cross, in John 14, 15, and 16, we read that Jesus promised to his apostles that when he was gone, he would give to them the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who would guide them, strengthen them, help them remember all that he had taught them, but lead them into truth. You see, he didn't just leave the church to struggle along on its own. The Catholic Church is the one holy Catholic Church, not because of anything primarily that we've done, that the apostles did, that 20 centuries of cardinals, bishops, priests, popes, religious, and even martyrs have done, but primarily because of the continuing presence and protective inspiration of the Holy Spirit, giving us the teachings that we are to follow in the, the leaders in the magisterium centered around the seat of Peter. But yet, the church remains one holy, Catholic, and apostolic because of you and me. We're called to be obedient in all that we do. If you have any struggles with your faith, I encourage you to never give up. Jesus is bigger than any problem we might have. If you have family members or friends who are, have left or are leaving the church, I encourage you to lift them before the Father in prayer. And if you have any questions about tonight's program, we ask you to be a part of this program. But first, I need to remind you that in memory of Mother Teresa, EWTN will preempt regular program this evening to bring you memorable dresses by Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa speaks eloquently of her experiences caring for the poorest of the poor and those dying of disease and starvation. She encourages us all to imitate Jesus. Thank you for joining this, e this evening. I want to ask that the, may the Lord mercifully bless and keep you and that we would see you again next week. God bless you.